party leader and served in the United States House of Representatives for 18 years. And Dr. Army holds a PhD in economics from the University of Oklahoma and is the former chairman of the University of North Texas Economic Department. Of course, welcome. Good to see you. Happy to know there's life after this place. And now we also introduce uh, Dr. Irons. Uh, he is the research and policy director at the Economic Policy Institute. His areas of expertise include the United States economy and economic policy, with an emphasis on federal tax and budget policy. Dr. Irons earned his PhD in economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and is the author of numerous publications. Dr. Irons formerly was economics professor at Amherst College and worked at the Center of American Progress, OMB Watch, and of course, Brookings Institute and Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Welcome, Dr. Irons. It's a long-standing tradition here that we swear our witnesses in. So uh, if you both would stand and raise your right hand. You agree to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. If so, please answer in the affirmative. Yeah. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Dr. Army, we will start with you first, um, of course, and as you know that the procedure is that we have five minutes and then, of course, the, uh, uh, we have the opportunity after that to raise questions with you and, uh, and further comments that you might have. So we welcome you and Dr. Army. Push that button. I'd like to spend, I'll be again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the invitation. And I'd like to spend a few minutes, just a quick review. The intellectual gantry for uh, such public policies as the stimulus package, of course, is John Maynard Keynes' general theory. And the notion was that in times of economic distress, downturn, governments could uh, put a spur to the economy by, uh, I think they called it pump priming. In Texas, we call it putting a spur to the economy. Uh, by either uh, temporarily running deficits uh, or uh, by either increasing spending or cutting taxes. There is a mixed review of the history of the Keynesian policy prescriptions and their success. I would be one that would suggest that uh, uh, on the uh, stimulate the economy through increasing spending side, there's a pretty, pretty de minimis uh, record of success in the history of the application of these theories, while on the other side of the coin, stimulating the economy through reduction in taxes has been a fairly uh, rich history of some success. The two most notable cases being the Kennedy tax cuts of 1962. Uh, and the Reagan tax cuts about 1982. Uh, I, of course, lived as an economist through both of these times, very exciting times for us in my, our profession. But one of the sweet ironies that I reflect back on in the, in the academic community, when President Kennedy proposed stimulating the economy through cutting taxes so you could uh, also increase revenues, it was considered an act of genius. He was celebrated in the academic community of being a president who was teaching us economics. When Ronald Reagan came back with exactly the same idea 20 years later, he was considered a moron in the academic community, <laughs> despite the fact that his success has to be considered even greater than that temporary success of the Kennedy tax cuts. I would argue that the larger problem that beleaguers the American economy today is we have an economy that is institutionally, structurally out of balance. And by that, I think you should look back and say the strength of every economy is the private sector. Every nation state in the history of the world that has tried to do, grow a strong economy through the public sector has had abject failure, serious resource misallocations and poverty and, and hardship. Or well, the United States, on the other hand, building its uh, economy on the basis of the private sector's initiatives has had the greatest track record in the history of the world. But there's a balance that must be struck between public and private activity. And there are various subscriptions. You can go back to Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. He had a very good outline. Uh, but the general principle was the public sector should be de minimis and focused on such things as uh, uh, public capital, 
uh, administering a system of justice especially such things as a system of contracts, which is, of course, if you have private enterprise, contracts are important, and, and you must, of course, be confident that your government will protect your contractual rights, uh, and, uh, and of course, security needs. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the basic notion here is that the, the government must, has a limited list of things that it must do, and it must do well with efficiency, the primary product of their successful efforts, of course, increase productivity on the private side, such roads, things as roads and transportation. I believe that is what has happened in the United States is we've crossed beyond the point of diminishing returns as government has grown out of control, uh, we've gotten to the point of negative returns. This, this discussion is, being, is a discussion, it's a lively discussion internationally. Uh, what is the appropriate size of the government relative to the economy? Uh, there, the, I'm proud to tell you that this international discussion is being carried out by and large in terms of something called the army curve. And the army curve says there's a point that is optimal where you have the necessary and sufficient rational de devotion of resources to government enterprise in support of private sector. Uh, sector initiatives and you maximize the performance of your economy. Beyond that, it becomes a burden. I think we've long since gone beyond that, ma that optimal point, and we are now at a point where the biggest single problem that belabors the American economy is the fact that the federal government is such a burden. And I, my analogy is this. In the competition between world economies, the United States has the fastest, most beautiful horse in the race. There's no doubt about it. The re our record of uh, accomplishment in the, uh, providing a standard of living for our citizens really is unparalleled, unchallenged even. But the horse is carrying a 500-pound gluttonous jockey. And this whole theory that you can, in fact, uh, improve your performance in this race of international economic competition by feeding the jockey and starving the horse is asinine. I don't know any other way to put it, but it's certainly counterproductive. And so what I would suggest to you is that the difficulties that, the, that have uh, belabored the American economy in the past, uh, dramatically in the past year, year and a half, have first been born out of misguided public policy. Most importantly, two decades of too easy money I asked myself when I looked at the, uh, the bubble burst on housing, how could so many people make so many bad decisions, irresponsible and uh, uh, counterproductive decisions? It's hard to imagine that. Uh, I saw my response was, well, when was the last time I did something foolish with money? Was the last time I had too much easy money? And so what we had was a period where the government created this enormous housing bubble. Uh, maybe for the best of misguided intentions, but still, nevertheless, it was a product of a bad public policy. The market could have corrected that as it did the dot-com crisis just a few years earlier, if left alone. But the government said, look, if, if we have too much of a bad, uh, too much of a good thing, the best, best way to improve on it is to have more of, a, uh, of too much of a good thing. And so we had uh, first the Bush stimulus package, which was a failure, then the high drama of the Bush uh, bailout, which was not only a failure but very offensive failure to the uh, constituency voting uh, or citizenry at large, and then that was followed on this enormous uh, uh, package uh, that is the current stimulus package. Now, there was one innovation in this recent effort that I find interesting, and that is the idea that we can track this money and make a direct uh, uh, tractability uh, recording of the jobs. Uh, my own view is this effort is by and large becoming clearly seen as empirically a bogus effort that is from its conception and in its administration only politically defined. And finally, two observations on that one. Politics is morally and intellectually inferior to virtually everything with the possible exception of sociology. Uh, and so if you, in fact, are making decisions out of a politically defined motive and you're letting your politics define your economics, you're probably going to come up with a bad notion. And just to be share, uh, fair, because in my, my testimony I, I quote so many of the correct thinking economists like Hayek and Mises and so forth, let me just end with a quote from, uh, 
from John Kenneth Galbraith uh, re related to this tracking exercise that is frankly comical, comicable at best. Uh, Galbraith said, beware of politicians that manufacture numbers for the sake of testimony. I think he's got a perfect example of what it is uh, that uh, he warned us against at that time. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Dr. Army. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Irons. Uh, th thank you for the opportunity today. Um, and I should warn you that I'm an economist who has manufactured numbers for the purpose of this testimony. Um, hopefully my manufactured numbers are not made up, but actually good estimates. Um, but let me, let me uh, um, start off by saying that there can be no accountability without transparency. And I applaud the efforts of this committee and the Congress and administration to take, uh, to take transparency seriously. My testimony today will focus primarily on jobs. I want to make four main points. Uh, these points are elaborated in my written testimony, but let me cover the basics here. First, as you've already heard, the recipient reports displayed on recovery.gov are not perfect. This should not be a surprise given the short time frame in which a system was implemented, given the sheer number of reports, and given the problems inherent in this kind of endeavor. To err is indeed human. Nevertheless, errors and inconsistencies are unacceptable and should be addressed whenever they are found. Second, while many of the media have highlighted cases in which jobs have been overstated by recipients, the underreporting appears to be at least as significant of a problem as overreporting. My written testimony has more detail on the kinds of problems, but let me highlight a couple examples. Uh, first, there are a number of cases in which the prime recipients do not appear to have correctly estimated saved jobs. One grant recipient stated, and I quote, there were a number of jobs held by construction workers that were lengthened because of the funding, and they reported zero jobs. This is a case where clearly they had jobs that were retained because of the Recovery Act, yet they reported zero. In many cases, subcontractors and subawardees are not required to report on job creation. It is often unclear if these jobs are included by prime recipients. One recipient of a $2.5 million contract, of which 90% was awarded to subcontractors, stated, and again I quote, one full-time job was created with the prime contractor's organization as a result of this award. The job is titled project manager. Clearly, this is the person who is in charge of managing the subcontractors. So for $2.5 million, they reported just one job created. They likely did not include the subcontractors. To give you a sense of the size of this potential problem, by my count, there are 2,181 reports in which projects have been started and recipients received more than $50,000, yet they reported zero jobs in their report. There are 528 reports in which projects have been started, recipients received more than $1 million, yet fewer than two jobs were reported. So there may be legitimate explanations for these outliers, but we should not necessarily conclude that the 640,000 total as presented by recovery.gov is an overstatement of the recipient jobs and might very well be an understatement. My third point, uh, I want to stress that recipient reports, while providing valuable information on projects and employment, cannot and will not capture the full true impact of the Recovery Act. In fact, the true impact of the Recovery Act will be far greater than the sum total of the recipient reports. For example, the data only include contracts, grants, and loans. Tax benefits and entitlements are not included. Of the funds paid out so far, only about $52 billion, just one-fourth of the total, is in the form of contracts, grants, and loans. Further, and importantly, these recipient reports only include direct jobs. For example, a new construction worker to hire to, to, hire to install a new roof will be included. The data does not include the job impact of construction workers respending on car repairs or restaurant dining. The data does not also include upstream supplier jobs at the companies that manufacture, transport, and sell roofing supplies at the wholesale or resale level. My fourth and last point, despite the problems with individual reports, it appears that the recipient report totals are consistent with accounts of economic advisors' job estimates and with other macroeconomic data and estimates. The economic evidence clearly shows that the Recovery Act is having an impact. Before the Recovery Act, employment was declining at an average monthly pace of over 500,000 jobs per month in the fourth quarter of 2008, and by nearly 700,000 jobs a month in the first three months of this year. The economy was in very much in free fall. In the most recent three-month period, employment declines have averaged fewer than 200,000 jobs. Before the Recovery Act, GDP was declining at a rapid rate, 
in the nine-month period ending in March this year, we saw the most rapid decline in GDP since quarterly data was first collected, going all the way back to 1947. So we had the most rapidly deteriorating economy in over 60 years. The most recent data shows a turnaround. GDP grew at a 3.5 percent annual rate in the most recent quarter. Now, using a methodology more suited to capture the full impact of the Recovery Act, including tax cuts, aid to states, and direct investments, and also including respending and upstream supplier jobs, the total number of jobs created or saved so far is likely between one and one and a half million jobs. This estimate is approximately consistent with the CEA's initial estimate in May of 1.5 million in the fourth quarter of 2009. Other forecasters, including Goldman Sachs, Macroeconomic Advisors, Moody's Economy.com, and others, have estimated GDP and employment impacts consistent with these estimates as well. Uh, these macro estimates are also consistent with the micro, micro data from recovery.gov recipient reports. In summary, it does appear that the Recovery Act is on track. Evidence from macro level data to model estimates to recovery.gov recipient reports all point to a significant impact on jobs in the broader economy. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> let me thank both of you for your testimony. And let me begin by um, uh, asking um, a question uh, of both of you. The Recovery Act, um, what is your impression of it? My impression of the Recovery Act was that uh, it was a wholly futile effort. If you take a look in, uh, in my adult lifetimes, all the years that I spent watching and studying on economic policy, what has worked to spur growth in recovery in the economy is cutting taxes and leaving the taxpayers who earn the money uh, actually become more investment. One of the things that, uh, and some, we have some very grievous institutional uh, dislocations in, in this fundamental structure of uh, so much public policy. Uh, and we start with the tax code. If you go way back to Adam Smith's 1776 Wealth of Nation, he says the road to economic growth is uh, abstinence, uh, savings, and investment. Uh, savings and investment are two economic activities that are double taxed, so they've given a double whammy disincentive uh, to savers and investment. Every smart tax reduction we've ever made, that is tax reduction aimed at diminishing the load on savers and investors of this activity has caused them to be more active and gener generated the economy. If, in fact, the, the uh, federal government by size and magnitude of spending is already redundant with even the interest on the national debt at that time being equal to the uh, entire budget of the Defense Department, uh, with uh, already existing current deficits of four, five hundred billion dollars to double down on what is redundant is, is not productive. Uh, let me share a broad impression. I'm afraid I don't have a, a good horse example, but let me use a, a different analogy. Um, before the Recovery Act was passed, the economy was in free fall. It, it, the economy had jumped out of a plane. It was declining at a very rapid rate. The recovery package was essentially a parachute, right? It opened up, it slowed the pace of decline. We still have jobs that are being lost, but they're being lost at a much slower pace. It gave the economy a chance to recover. Uh, it's not going to be the end and be all. It's not going to get us from where we are to a fantastic economy. No one's claiming that the economy that we're currently in is a great environment, but at least stopped the worst from happening. It stopped us from going off the cliff. Um, in terms of the policy, um, <clears throat> I tend to be more of a, I call it a kitchen sink economist. Um, I think we should try a little bit of everything. And I think in the recovery package, you saw that there was a number of investments. There was aid to states. There were tax cuts as part of the package. And I think that a problem of the size that we had demanded a comprehensive, broad-based solution. I think that's what the recovery package represented. So I'm very optimistic that this you know, gives the economy a chance to turn around. It stopped the downward spiral uh, and, and gave us a chance to recover. Um, on the tax cut component, um, I think there are components of the recovery package which um, I might not be as fond of as other parts, including some of the tax cuts. And I, I find it interesting that um, the Bush tax cuts were not listed as part of the success stories in terms of stimulus. In fact, we had the, uh, one of the worst recoveries on record uh, after the Bush tax cuts were passed. 
And so I think the record in most recent times of the efficacy of tax cuts as stimulus has been uh, at best mixed. Um, and I think we need to think about what kinds of tax cuts. Tax cuts are not a generic thing. There are tax cuts that I think for low and middle income Americans, which can be respent, can be very effective stimulus. Tax cuts um, for businesses who need customers, not tax cuts, uh, are in many ways probably not a good idea. Um, so I don't think we should talk about tax cuts as, in the abstract. We should have a more nuanced view. Dr. Hines, I'm deeply concerned that the unemployment rate has now surpassed 10 percent. Is this evidence that the Recovery Act is not working or that the projections of the Council of Economic Advisers that they were wrong? Uh, I don't think it is. I, I agree with you. I think the 10 percent unemployment rate is a huge problem. Um, I think the high unemployment rate is a result of a disastrous economy uh, that was in place before the Recovery Act was passed. And I think when you look at the projections of the Council of Economic Advisers, uh, where they thought the economy would be, uh, they, along with private forecasters, uh, were, very, were overly optimistic about how high the unemployment rate would rise. So the fact that we have a 10 percent unemployment rate is a statement not about the recovery package, but is a statement about the state of the economy before the recovery package was passed. And in fact, if it were not for the recovery package, we'd have a much higher unemployment rate. So my example of the economy in free fall and a parachute, uh, it has slowed down the deceleration, but you still see some increase in the unemployment rate. At the same time, you don't want to cut yourself loose of that parachute. That would make things much worse. And that's the case we would be in if we did not have that parachute, if we did not have the Recovery Act in place. I yield to uh, the gentleman from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, I got so many questions. I don't know where to start this group. Um, Thank you for your uh, testimony, uh, Mr. Army. I uh, am curious. I know that in the, in the previous testimony we heard earlier, uh, they were talking about all the jobs that have been created and saved. And uh, one of my concerns is the two-thirds of jobs happen to be with the Department of Education. They've created 400,000 out of the uh, 640,000 jobs. And in the testimony, it appears that all they did was make sure that the teachers' budgets or the education budgets are funded for another year, which means what are we going to do next year? And so it doesn't look like we've created or saved a permanent job because we haven't fixed an economic problem that will allow that job to continue unless we continue to find another stimulus that primes the pump again. What's well, your analysis of that? My own view is that, first of all, there's been very little distribution of this uh, massive amount of money that shocked the world. Uh, but it, by and large, it's been distributed intra-governmentally. So you're getting some public jobs that are perhaps being retained that might not otherwise have been, but they're, uh, uh, I, I, you certainly not think constitutes a, a, a recovery. What, uh, the thing that gives you recovery is when the private sector investor class engages. That's what happened in the aftermath of the Reagan taxes. And you're correct. I did, uh, did not mention the Bush tax cuts. We got an anemic recovery out of them because there was so much income redistribution in that package of tax cuts as opposed to st a stimulation for investment and savings. It was that was a tax cut package that was too politically defined to be as effective as it might otherwise have been. And I, I, I made the point earlier, you need smart tax cuts. If they're just income redistributional tax cuts, they, they do you very little good. So the fact of the matter is you have uh, some demonstration of direct linkage between uh, jobs in the government sector with intergovernmental uh, 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 awards but a more than discouraging dramatic demonstration of declining employment in the private sector that gives you the 10 percent overall reduction in employment or unemployment rate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I sit on the Small Business Committee and uh, it takes about 67,000 jobs according to the testimony we've heard a number of times to create a job for small business. Yet the average in this package is about $246,000 that's created so far. Um, I know that in this, this package there was $31 billion roughly of small business tax credits and things like that. Um, do you know off the top of your head, uh, Mr. Irons, how many jobs were created or saved uh, as a result of those tax credits? No, I don't. Uh, I, but again, let me just say, 
There's a generic uh, rule of thumb I think you can imply that public sector job creation is very costly and results in virtually no enhanced productivity for the economy as a whole. Private sector job creation uh, coming from the investment sector where in fact you expand the application of science and engineering through new, new capital investment increases productivity and in fact results in a, a much greater as it were bang for your buck in terms of the productivity gains that result in increased sustainability of the jobs. That's why you see a greater permanence in the jobs uh, created on the private sector. Um, also, with regards to uh, you know, this, this stimulus package, is, is we're incurring a huge amount of debt. Mr. Arns, Dr. Arns, uh, what do you feel is an adequate level of debt for our economy to be able to, to, uh, to live with? Oh, that's a good question, and, and that's, I don't think it's a knowable question. Um, there's no specific number where if you're below it, you're fine. If you're above it, you're in trouble. Um, I mean a half a billion dollars or half a trillion dollars worth of interest is something we can continue to sustain forever? The, the question is what is a sustainable level? I think that is the key question. And I think there you have to look at the, how fast the economy grows and then how fast the deficit increases the, the debt. And I think if you are underneath a threshold which keeps the debt from rising as a share of the economy, you're in okay territory. If the debt is rising faster than the economy as a whole, then you're in, in trouble. Um, the way I describe it is, uh, you know, Bill Gates can carry a bigger debt than, than I can uh, because of his income. And so long as our GDP is rising, we can continue well, to maintain higher levels not, of debt. not doing very well right now. That's my question. Where do you think we need to go? Are we, I, are we maxed out? Do we need to stop borrowing I, money? I don't think we're maxed out. I think we can still borrow money. We can money. still borrow more money. With, with the caveat, we can absolutely still borrow money. Thank uh, with you. The uh, that the Mr. Army, before I run out of my time, I apologize, but I'm, my time is limited. Well, Mr. Army, of course, the market, well, if, uh, finally, the market reveals everything eventually. One, one, one of the, uh, I think, uh, what is it they say, canaries in the mind that I'm looking at right now is the activity of the, uh, of the carry trade. These bet on currencies. Mm -hmm. They used to, they were for, for years recently, they were betting against the Japanese currency, correctly so. Now they're betting against the United States currency because we are flooding the world with dollars and there's a decreasing willingness on the part of the world to, uh, to own our debt. And uh, the fact is, the government acquires money in three ways. They tax it directly or they borrow it. In a declining world willingness to do so, they end up printing it. If they print it, then they tax indirectly by uh, deflating uh, uh, or inflating the currency, deflating its purchasing power, and, and it comes back. It's in in the, almost every case, the cost of current uh, mismanaged fiscal policy falls on a future generation. Thank you for your testimony. Neil back my time. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I now yield to the gentleman who at one point chaired this committee for six years, Mr. Burton from Indiana. And I look so young. <coughs> In the picture. In the, knock it off. Put that down. You know, uh, the President has said and his administration has said they created 640,329 jobs. That's pretty specific. You'd think they'd be able to account for those jobs since they're so specific down to the axial job. I mean, 329? How do you account for that? Uh, well, I think the number that's presented is I know, the, but do you think that they can really be that accurate? Right it is, uh, no, it is a number actually 60, 640,329. No, there Something are, there are errors on, on, on different things. Absolutely not. The administration did not pull this out of their heads. This is the sum total of the recipient reports. Okay. Right? So, so these are what the recipients report and they added that up. Well, where did you go to school? Uh, graduate school, MIT. And before that, Swarthmore? Swarthmore College, yes, yeah. that's right. How old are you? Uh, that's a good question. What, what year is it? Uh, 39. 39? Yeah. See, in 1982, where were you? How old would you have been in 1982? It would be 12. 12. Well, in 1982, I became a congressman, and I don't think you were here, Dick, but uh, we had a guy that came into the White House, and uh, we'd come out of the Carter administration with 14% um, inflation, 12% unemployment, called it a misery index, 26%, and they were throwing money 